Okay, we are here today with Dom from the Logos Project. How are you doing, Dom? I'm doing good. Hey, Zico, how are you? Very good. Thanks for coming. We are discussing today uh, the Ottaviani intervention, the Ottaviani Bachi interven intervention. We are discussing today what they didn't tell you about the Ottaviani intervention. So, <laughs> what they didn't tell you, Dom? Tell us. Yes. So thanks for having me on the show, Ezekiel. Uh, it's, it's good to do a video again. Um, yeah, the Ottaviani intervention. Um, so the first thing to point out is that this is often brought up um, in traditionalist circles in general, uh, more in the kind of, you know, not really in diocesan parishes, although it does come up there sometimes, but it's mostly in like some of the Ecclesia Dei, uh, formerly Ecclesia Dei, um, uh, circles and but especially the Society of Saint Pius X, of course, and the the Ottaviani intervention. It's it's actually a document here. Um, let me pull up my notes just to make sure I get this accurately. So it was written by uh, two Italian, no, sorry, two two priests, one Italian, I think, one French, and uh, I'll, I'll, I think the one of them, a lot of people think, was um, what's his name. Um, uh, uh, Gérard de Laurier, who eventually became a city of a contest. Um, now, it's basically, a, 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 it's called a brief critical study of the new order of mass. And it was written by, by these people. And um, it was uh, supposedly uh, read over by Cardinals Ottaviani and Bacci. And they uh, drafted a accompanying letter uh, and signed the letter and sent it to Pope Paul VI. And this was in uh, 1969, either, I think it was between May and September of 1969. And it was basically uh, a letter that uh, was critical of the um, new missile that was going to come out uh, that year. Um, and Pope Paul VI um, received that letter and uh, the missile uh, was unchanged and published and implemented. And in uh, 1970, you know, everyone was saying, not everyone, but uh, most of uh, Roman Catholic parishes were saying the new missile. Uh, and so the, the controversy is that this uh, brief critical study of the new order of mass is uh, used to, to show that the new missile is as as the study puts it a departure from the theology of the council of trent and so in other right. words yeah in other words the 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 claim here is that the new missile is in fact not orthodox um okay yes it, it, it is no not only uh the claim is not only a departure but a but a grave departure you know? yeah no the, the claims are very serious now, it, what's interesting to me is that why is why has no uh, Catholic kind of stepped up and defended the the Church's promulgation of, of the missile, especially in light of this this critical study? It, it seems to me that the answer is twofold. Number one, someone did, and we'll talk about that very shortly. Uh, and but it was it was a French letter published in a journal uh, uh, that was um, uh, read by Cardinal Ottaviani. He agreed with it, and, um, and and we'll talk about that too. But the, the point being is this: the second point is why was this not more uh, spread, right? And I think the the simple answer, having read the the study, having having read uh, that French uh, response, and also uh, Michael Davies's book Pope Paul's New Mass, I came to realize that the reason why nobody addressed this is because nobody took it seriously. <laughs> so I don't know how I sound crazy, but, um, you know, I've, I've been spending the last several months uh, de uh, with a, a deep dive into the liturgical theology of Pope Benedict XVI. And it dawned on me that, how to put this charitably, the, the critical study is ridiculous, right? So it, it's actually... Um, how to put this? It, it's it's not it's it's not taken seriously by anybody. Now I'm I'm not trying to say you know uh, I'm not trying to basically say because it's ridiculous, therefore everything is fine and I won the argument, right? No, I'm saying no one really is engaging in the argument because no one is taking it seriously. However, uh, there's a difference between the document itself and its influence, its impact in circles in the church. I think that 
people should have taken that seriously. And so what I'm hoping to do here is to remedy that uh, area where, um, you know, the document itself, I don't think is worth taking seriously, but its influence is worth taking seriously. So uh, in 1970, um, uh, in, uh, on 17, uh, uh, the 17th of February of 1970, uh, Don Gérard Lafon, who is um, a, a priest from the Order of the Knights of Our Lady in France, replied to the uh, brief critical study um, and basically uh, laid out where it goes wrong and why and how the faithful ought not to worry. So Don Lafont actually did do what I was what I, I wish more people had done, which is reply to this and show how it's it's not to be taken seriously and that we ought to to listen to the church. Now, uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to get into the liturgical crisis that we're in, and we can talk about that and nuance everything, you know, and there's a lot of facets and details. But I really want to take a look at this critical study because it's it's quite damning. Um, you know, what, I, what I've, I've come to the conclusion after reading it, first of all, reading it, it was very, uh, at first it was like frustrating. And then it just became boring because it was just it was it was very uh, yeah. it, it was it, it was very superficial, right? But I think the best. Sorry, Dom. Yeah. Can, can I ask you a question here? And then yeah. you can continue. We are talking about two two separate things because one thing is the brief critical study that is like I yeah. don't know like fifteen pages long, mm -hmm. and uh, then you yeah. have the then you have a letter, yes. which is sent to. Uh, Pope uh, Paul VI, right? Yeah. So the the study is, as you said, is that it's a it's a pamphlet size study, and accompanying it is a letter signed by Cardinals Ottaviani and Bacci uh, that accompanies that study. So th these are two distinct things: the study, and then the letter by the cardinals. Okay. In um, the study, in the study, they uh, like uh, do their. Um, investigation about the, what is wrong with the missile and in yes. the letter they, they drive out the, the conclusions right that the uh, missile itself I, I want to clarify not that the missile in practice but the missile itself the letter of the missile uh, yeah. de departs gravely from the traditional teaching of the church that is yeah. what they sent to Paul the six yes yeah I mean the study itself is ruthless in its uh, uh degrading of the missile itself um now, no one is claiming that missiles are perfect, right? But uh, we will get into Octarium Fidei. But the, uh, the the accompanying letter does kind of lay out the conclusion, which is uh, Pope Paul, don't do this. This is a, this is a departure and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, uh, that is the conclusion that the missile itself is problematic. Uh, and because it hadn't been implemented yet, you know, although certain abuses were actually in vogue before its implementation. But uh, yes, that is what it says. But what, what I, a conclusion I came to is that if you really want a thorough answer uh, that will require some thinking and some praying and some contemplation and some theology, the best answer to to this critical this brief critical study is Pope Benedict the Sixteenth's post synodal exhortation Sacramentum Caritatis. If you read right. through that, you realize that this is silly nonsense, right? Um, so. Don Lafon's letter was published in France in, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a journal in 1970, very closely after this brief critical study. And uh, he, he has attached to it a letter by Cardinal Ottaviani saying mm -hmm. that um, the, uh, the brief critical study was not to be published publicly, right? Uh, and uh, Michael Davies backs this up saying that uh, one of the priests that uh, was behind this brief critical study actually gave the brief critical study to uh, a traditionalist priest and told him, you know, uh, wait, wait about a month before you publish this. You know, the, the, the Pope will probably make it public or something. The point being is that it was leaked, right? It was leaked. And um, but Cardinal Taviani said that uh, this is not, in fact, something that uh, I wanted to be published and also that. Um, he, he, he disagrees with it uh, and that he, um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of details to this, but turns out that if I could read a, a section here, um, yeah. so maybe you can read the, 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 the response of Fotaviani to, uh, Don Lafon's apology of the new mass. Yes. Right? Uh, you, you mean, uh, Don Lafon's response? 
No, not, not Don Lafon's response, but what Otaviani said to Don Lafon when Don Lafon kind of refused. Oh, to yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually don't have that pulled up. Let me let me go ahead and do that right now. Uh, but as I'm pulling this up, um, it it turns out. Sorry, I'm I'm all over the place. Uh, let me let me pull this up right here. So th this 1970 letter by Don Lafon, right, was published in 1970, the day, uh, the the year uh, of the, the 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 promulgation of the missile, although it's 6970, and it it stayed in French up until last year, right? Where mm -hmm. I I found it because uh, John Salza sent it to me, and I right. I translated it into English, uh, you know, with all with help from different tools and. And, and uh, just to kind of do it as quickly as possible and then published it on my website, uh, right. on my blog site. John, and so John, John, John understood the, the French or he asked you to, to translate? I don't think he, he might, but I don't think so. Um, because of my background growing up in France, uh, you know, yeah. French being my, my first language, it, it was it was fairly easy. But I, I, I did use Google and to go faster. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's great news because... Uh, Due to your um, translation, I'm now translating it to Spanish. Oh, excellent! <laughs> so we'll have it. So we'll have it uh, every word uh, around Latin America. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and, and La Fons, uh, it's called a theological note or a theological memorandum. It's it's actually very good. It's um, you know, it, it's it's a very good response. I I think that there's further things that could have been said, but at for something that was done at the time. It's very good. So what I think would be a good idea would be that if Don Lafon's uh, memorandum was spread just as much as uh, the critical, the brief critical study, the so-called Ottaviani intervention, that would be great. But here's what uh, Ottaviani uh, said to Don Lafon. Let me go ahead and pull it up. Uh, can I can I do some some jump yeah. in? A, a go ahead. Sec. Uh, it is important to, to clarify another thing, which is uh, Dom Lafon says in his memorandum that he's not attempting to respond and refute the brief critical study, all right? The pamphlet, the, the whole pamphlet. Yeah. He says, mm -hmm. I won't do that because that would be a tedious uh, uh, work. Uh, yeah. Although it would be very easy to do, he says, right? Yeah. Well, so when you, when, you, when you say that the brief critical study, when you read it, you 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 recognize that it was nonsense. Don yeah. Lafon is kind of saying the same thing. He, that, he said, that's what I realized. Yeah, I, I won't refute this because it would be a tedious work. Yeah, although it would be easy. I'm just saying a few things just to calm down the the spirit of Catholics who, who might be like yeah. uh, confused. You know, um, mm -hmm. but now tell us what. Uh, Otto, Cardinal Ottaviani said yeah. about the, the, the and yeah and and that's right that is what Don Lafon says he basically says like this is this is silly this is nonsense uh, and yet to his credit he does still address uh, major points of the study so I, I think that's great it's a kind of a typical French rhetorical move which is this is silly I'm not going to spend time with it <laughs> and then he spends time with it right so <laughs> if you ask um, if you ask if you ask I'll do it <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Cardinal Ottaviani writes, um, uh, in, you know, on February 11th, 1970, very reverend father, Don Lafon, I received your letter of 23 January and the doctrinal memorandum uh, dated January 29th. Uh, I congratulate you on your work, which is exceptional in its objectivity and in the dignity of its expression. This was not always, alas, the case in this controversy in which we saw ordinary Christians genuinely offended mixed with those who take advantage of the anxiety of souls to increase general confusion. For my part, I only regret having been used in a way that I did not intend by the publishing of a letter that I sent to the Holy Father without giving anyone permission to publish it. I have rejoiced profoundly to read the address by the Holy Father on the question of the new Ordo Mise, and especially on the doctrinal clarifications contained in his public addresses of the 19th and 26th of November after which I believe no one can any longer be genuinely scandalized. As for the rest, a prudent and intelligent catechesis must be undertaken to solve some legitimate perplexities uh, that the text may generate. In this sense, I wish your doctrinal memorandum and the activity of the Militia Sancte Maria wide distribution and success. Sincerely, 
Most Reverend Father, the expression of my distinguished honor is accompanied by a blessing for all your employees and members of the militia, Alfred Cardinal Ottaviani. So that there you have it. Now, um, of course, uh, I, you know, I'm thinking of the what the traditionalist uh, who is a proponent of this would say, and they're going to point to Michael Davies's book, uh, Pope Paul's New Mass, in which Michael Davies has a chapter on this. And I, I read that chapter several times, um, and I realized that it quickly became a he said, she said game, right? Where you have a lot of people saying, well, Cardinal Ottaviani was blind. How would he read the, 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 the letter of Don Lafon, right? And Don Lafon, in fact, implies as well that because Cardinal Ottaviani is blind, he didn't read the brief critical study. And so yeah. suddenly it, it became, I realized that everyone was saying he said, she said, you know, and, and, um, it, 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 and the, there's no possibility of kind of vindicating uh, what actually happened with, with proof, right? But what we do have is a brief critical study. And Don Lafon's uh, uh, note here is theological, is doctrinal note, right? And we have two claims, right? Uh, one, but, but one actually comports better with the evidence because Cardinal Taviani, in his response to Don Lafon, says, yes, I sent that letter to the Pope, right? So he was aware of uh, the study, but also he says, uh, I wish it hadn't been published. And finally, he said he still admits, even in his response to Don Lafon, that there are some perplexities that I'm struggling with, uh, but a good a good clarification will help in this area. Yeah. So uh, Don Lafon's side comports with the evidence. But regardless of that, the real question is, what does the critical study say and what does Lafon's note say? And that's yeah. really what matters. Can and I, I say that, something before yeah. you, you begin in that? Yeah. I, I want to say something directed to, you know, I, I don't know who will watch this video, but directed to mm -hmm. uh, people who have, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reproduced the, the this, uh, this Ottaviani uh, letter to Pope Paul the, the VI. You know, yeah. we have to we have to say some things here because uh, the se the the first thing is this the following: uh, Ottaviani never meant that letter to be published. So mm -hmm. every time, every single time that a a any any person uh, uses that letter in order to um, to uh, you know. Uh, to attack make, the, the new missiles. Or yes, the, attack the new missile yeah. make make people uh, become perplexed. Yeah, like Don Lafon writes. Yeah, with a, with a new missile, you know, to, to stop going to the new missile. You are mm -hmm. you are doing something which Cardinal Ottaviani didn't want to 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 be done. Exactly. That's a, the first thing, and and the second thing is Cardinal Ottaviani uh, finally. Uh, um, confirmed that the new missile was orthodox. We, we have just read it. So if you mm -hmm. have uh, been publishing that Ottaviani intervention, you, you should now publish uh, the Ottaviani response to Don Lafon. No? That yeah, would be... Yeah. Because if not, you're, you're telling half the, half the story. That's why the, the, this, this show is called What They Didn't Tell You. This is what yeah. they didn't tell you. No? They didn't no, tell you that, right. Ottaviani, that Ottaviani said, okay, it's fine. Uh, this can be the new missile can be interpreted uh, in an orthodox way. It, it is orthodox, you know. So, yeah. but another thing I want I wanted to say before you dig in in what what you were going yeah. to say is the the following. You you already mentioned this this kind of gets like uh, he says she says. So mm -hmm. we we finally we we are uh, we are basing our claims. Uh, upon a, what, what a cardinal say you know cardinal is not infallible cardinal can can err this cardinal maybe he was blind you know we, we don't know mm -hmm. so why why don't we go to the magisterium to yeah. the to the ancient ma magisterium why don't yeah. we go to to pius the six maybe, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> yeah yeah what, you're what talking about he, Octorium fidei yeah yeah what does he say about he says about the about the, uh, the church being able to promulgate evil uh, rights, you know, evil discipline. Yeah. So let me address that. Right. So um, let me just make a quick point. <clears throat> Oftentimes, when I look at uh, a subject and I, I try to kind of get to the bottom of it, uh, obviously, as a Catholic, 
uh, I, I show deference and I take, uh, I presuppose that the magisterium is right as a Catholic, right? But when I engage in apologetics or when I uh, look into an issue, I, I, what I do is I first look at the claims apart from, from my deference to the magisterium and try to see and try to understand both sides of the question and uncover the truth about something. And, and if, I, if I'm objective and if I'm faithful, and I argue for the truth of that thing, and then it, it, it will turn out to line up with what the magisterium said. So my point being is I, I kind of play, um, how to put it, it's like if I was talking to a Protestant, right? I wouldn't tell the Protestant, um, the church has spoken, you know, therefore this is what, what's, what the, how you interpret scripture. I would say, mm -hmm. well, look at this passage of scripture and have you considered this, this, this detail and how that sheds light? And guess what? That's what the Catholic church teaches. See how it's reasonable. So th that's what I would, would do. Uh, now, obviously, a traditionalist is a Catholic, and therefore, he should also be giving deference and presupposing that the magisterium is right. And it's kind of astonishing that he's not doing that. But I'm like, fine, let's play the game. Let's do it. And so um, one thing I want to point out before I read from Octarium Fidei is that Cardo Taviani uh, has seen all the texts of the New Ordo and has approved them. And so this is something Don Lafon points out. He says, certain formulas were even adopted precisely at his request. In particular, the eschatological formulas and those concerning the liturgy of the dead in the third anaphora. So the point here is this. Um, Cardinal, uh, most of the criticisms of the short critical study cannot have received the approval of the great cardinal since they come off as so devoid of value and objectivity is what Don Lafont tells us. We are thus faced with speculation. Either the cardinal did not approve the short critical study or it is possible that no one took care to read it to him because he was blind, right? And, and so uh, he, he adds, by agreeing to include his name at the bottom of the petition, Cardinal Taviani approved at least the request to keep the order of St. Pius V, and he declared himself in solidarity with all those who suffer from the perpetual changes to the liturgy or from the unbelievable fantasies from individuals or groups that are springing up almost everywhere on the fringes of the official reforms. His action will not have been in vain. Thanks to him, all the priests who celebrate in Latin will be able until November 30th, 1971, to use one or the other ordo. Thanks to him, again, elderly priests will not have to, to relearn how to say mass. And thanks to him, finally, the definition from chapter two, which we can get into, will have uh, will be able to be revised. And it was revised. And so that's part of the controversy. But the point being is that if Cardinal Ottaviani if he was read, uh, if, if the critical study was read to him, then why did he actually implement part of the uh, new missile into uh, uh, some of the things that, that you know, he wrote, right? So th that's something that's problematic. It doesn't comport. Now, he, here's the thing. At the end of the day, if you want to insist that Cardinal Ottaviani did read and agree with the critical study, that doesn't look good for Cardinal Ottaviani because it's a silly theological study. It's quite, it's really embarrassing, right? And so if you're going to say, Card no, no, Cardinal Ottaviani read this and agreed with it, uh, I want to protect the Cardinal's good name because if that's the case, then the Cardinal is not really bright. And I don't think that's true. I think the Cardinal was a, a good and, and bright person. I mean, he was head of the CDF. It wasn't called the CDF back then, right? But, uh, he, you know, he, he was someone that was at the council, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy about that. But the point being is that, you don't want the cardinal to have read this and to have agreed with it because it's very silly. And we'll get into the details. But let me read um, what Octor M. Fidei says from uh, Pope Pius VI here. Uh, it's condemned proposition number 78. And for some quick background, Octor M. Fidei was uh, uh, a list of condemnations with various levels of condemnations uh, directed towards the Synod of Pistoia, which was a Jansenist Synod. I've done a whole series on this. It's very interesting because... The brief critical study actually brings up the Synod of Pistoia in a footnote, which is really interesting to me, right? So if you guys want more context, I have a whole series with Dr. Sean Blanchard where we go right. over the Synod, its relationship to the unfolding of Reformed Catholicism and what that means uh, and the place of Octarium Fidei. But this is what Octarium Fidei says. It says in uh, uh, Condemned Proposition Number 78, quote, the church, which is ruled by the Spirit of God, could establish a discipline Sorry, let me reread that. The church, which is ruled by the Spirit of God, could establish a discipline a discipline not merely useless and insupportable for the Christian spirit, 
but even dangerous, harmful, and conducive to superstition and to materialism. And so that proposition is condemned, right? And it's condemned as false, temerious, scandalous, pernicious, offensive to pious ears, injurious to the church and to the spirit of God who guides her at the least and says at the least erroneous. Now, here's the point about that uh, that condemnation. It speaks to a deeper theological meaning, right? Which is if the church can institute a right that actually um, destroys the faith of the faithful, then we're talking about the liturgical expression of the church being unorthodox, right? Now, what does the Roman canon tell us, right? Lord, look not upon our sins, but on the faith of your church. Why? Because the faith of the church is pure and orthodox. Its grounding, in fact, is the yes of Mary. That's why she's immaculately conceived. And so Mary's yes, right, is protected. You know, this, think of the picture of the Holy Family. Mary is the woman. She's Israel, right? She's the church. In her midst is the word made flesh, right? Word and sacrament, our Lord. And beside her is Joseph with his crozier, right? who is a virgin because he protects the church, right? He's married to her, but he's chaste, right? This is the bishop with the crozier. But also the, the, the staff is often depicted as, as flowering with lilies, which is a sign of purity. So in the Holy Family, you have the picture of the church, of the, 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 the virgin woman who is the mother, virgin and mother, of the word made flesh, word and sacraments, protected by the, uh, the, the chaste, bishop right with the authority to fend off anyone who attacks the faith of the church now the liturgy especially in the mass is the concrete realization of the church's faith it's 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 the church's expression of her faith so if you're going to argue that the church's liturgical rites are unorthodox you're in fact arguing that the church's faith has failed, has become unorthodox, has become tainted, right? And the entire uh, harmony of the Catholic faith completely falls apart, right? Yeah. And so and, and that's not a Catholic position. But but uh, we've been talking a lot about preliminary principles, but let's maybe get into what the brief uh, critical study says. And there's some stuff in there. I was like, what? <laughs> so... Uh, maybe we can get into that. What, anything else you want to bring up? Yeah, just, just two things. Uh, yeah. First one, uh, th th this is the, not the only uh, the only time that the Magisterium says something like this. You know, the Council yeah. of Trent says something similar. Gregory the Sixteenth says quite the, the same thing as Pius VI. Like the Church is governed by the Spirit of God. He, it, mm -hmm. it cannot give a harmful discipline. So yeah. what is striking is that Monsignor Lefebvre's claims are exactly the opposite of what you have read. He says yeah, unfortunately. the exact same words, the, the, the word harm, harmful to souls. Yeah. That's the word mm -hmm. that Pius VI has, uh, has yeah, used. Yeah, it's stunning. It's stunning. So so if, if, if these guys want to be traditional, why don't they hear the Pius VI's words? No? Mm -hmm. I can't understand. But uh, the, yeah. the other thing is maybe some objections I, I see coming. The first one is, oh, you know, this Pius VI is it's very old. It was uh, it, it it applies only to that moment, not not to 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 this yeah. to this moment. You know, it applies to to the lead to the ancient liturgy, not to a new order mass. You know, that that, that objection is like a modernist objection or a, or a liberal <laughs> objection. Like when you say, yeah. hey. Uh, you know, uh, contraception is wrong because, uh, uh, you know, um, Pius XI says so. What what will a modernist say you say to you? He will say, mm -hmm. oh, but it, it, it is old. You know, things have changed now. It's the same objection as, as a modernist. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. It's it, this idea that um, uh, because, you know, for, so I've heard this before, right? The declarations in Trent about the liturgy have to do with the context of the Protestant Reformation and how the Protestants were destroying the liturgy and the church was saying, no, don't destroy the liturgy. And you can't say that our rights um, need to be destroyed. Therefore, that's the context. Now, there's some truth to that. Right. But but the point being the point that you're making, which is a very good point, which is the church's legislation, although it's historically contextualized, it, it also is saying something objectively true. Right. And the truth can't change. 
if you think the truth is relegated to historical circumstances, that's what modernism is, as you pointed out, right? And so, sorry, my nose is itching me. And so the <laughs> the, the point is, um, the, the tr what the Council of Trent is saying applies to the historical context of the Protestant Reformation, but it's it's the application of a, of a of a doctrinal principle, which is that the rights of the church cannot be unorthodox in light of the faith of the church, which is protected by our Lord through the charism of truth, as Saint Irenaeus speaks of, of the College of Bishops, as they are in communion with the head of the college, the the, the Pope, basically. So. Again, let's not let's not play this modernist game, right? Let's let's be consistent and let's try to understand things in light of these principles. Uh, but we can even set these principles aside and look at the evidence. That's what I yeah, like yeah. to do. Go yeah. on, go on. Okay, <laughs> so uh, let's let's just go through some of this and stop me at any time, you know. And uh, I have all morning. I don't know about you. You might have to go, but uh, let, have time. Have time. okay, let's let's go through some of this. Um, so the first thing, right, is. Uh, the brief critical study says the people never on any account asked for the liturgy to be changed or mutilated so as to understand it better. <laughs> they asked for a better understanding of a changeless liturgy and one which they would never have wanted changed. So first of all, the use of the term mutilated, right, uh, you know, presupposes a bias. Now, I'm not saying that's not true. Uh, let's, let's look at what it says, right? In other words, the people never asked for a change. That's nonsense. I mean, you don't have to be happy with the change and you can criticize the change, right? Without calling into question the orthodoxy of the change. But that's nonsense. Pope, John's, uh, Pope John sent a survey before the council to the bishops of the world. And the reform of the liturgical books was the most unanimous and consistent subject that was brought up by the, all the dioceses of the world, worldwide, right? And, and so in Sacrosanctum Concilium at the council was the least contro controversial document. It was the first one passed pretty much unanimously. There might have been four or seven abs abstentions. I can't remember exactly. Or it might have been uh, uh, voting no. But out of like thousands of bishops, right? So this is nonsense. The reforms of St. Pius X to the Breviary and Pius XII to the Triduum. And eventually John XXIII's reform of the Missal itself, which is the Missal, the Society of St. Pius X celebrates right so uh we're starting off with this kind of historically inaccurate uh depiction that's how it begins but the real contention uh, as, as i realize this it really is about the germ g-i-r-m general instruction to the roman missile this is where the real contention lies because in it is a definition of the mass right and that definition of the mass is what they have a problem with and we're going to look at that right the first thing to point out, this is something Don Lafont explains, to, to quote him real quick. He says, let us first draw attention to the fact that the presence of a definition of the Mass in a code of rubrics is unusual. The Missal of St. Pius V did not include any. The rubrics are not a theological treatise. This definition was not elaborated on, but merely inserted after the fact. So the first thing to point out is that this is just not something usual. So it's almost like besides the fact. But that being said, let's look at it anyway. The, the brief critical study, the Ottaviani intervention, I don't like calling it the Ottaviani intervention, but it, it says that uh, nothing in the definition uh, it, it, in the very least implies the following things, right? It doesn't imply real presence. It doesn't imply the reality of the sacrifice. And it doesn't imply the sacramental function of the priest. And fourth and finally, it doesn't imply the intrinsic value of Eucharistic sacrifice apart from the people's presence. These are the four accusations to the definition. And at face value, Don Lafon himself agrees, yeah, it could be read that way. So let's 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 actually point that out, right? But first, uh, they, they, they end up saying the deliberate, so quoting them, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, quoting them, so the deliberate omission leads to to the suppression basically of these of these dogmas and at least in practice to their denial right and so first of all that's not how church teaching works right if the church doesn't mention that christ is divine in tomorrow's apostolic exhortation it doesn't mean that now it's up for grabs right that we can say well christ isn't divine that being said there is some, uh, something to say here about uh what the church ought to do right but here's the thing one this isn't even magisterial two 
the definition refers to the specific conciliar texts where these dogmas are in fact iterated. And three, the definition has changed anyway. <laughs> so, so this definition now includes, um, in fact, let me read to you what the new definition says. So the old definition said, um, oh, I wish I had it here. Basically that the mass or the Lord's Supper is a sacred uh, uh, synaxis is the way they put it, a gathering, right? Where uh, the, 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 the priest uh, uh, presides over the uh, assembly of the people um, uh, I, I can't remember all the details, but uh, it does seem kind of equivocal. But here's what it says now, right? In, in, in the, the GIRM, G-I-R-M, paragraph 27 reads, quote, at mass, that is the Lord's Supper, the people of God is called together with a priest presiding and acting in the person of Christ to celebrate the memorial of the Lord, the Eucharistic sacrifice. That's what it says. So, and, and I think that, um, well, yeah. So in other words, the point is moot. Like this, this whole section of the critique just doesn't apply whatsoever about the definition, right? It, it didn't apply in the beginning, even though the definition wasn't, I think, very good, right? Uh, in fact, it could have lent itself to, to misreadings, but it still didn't apply, technically speaking, if you want to think this way, right? But it was changed. So it doesn't matter anymore. It's not true anymore, right? So, and it was changed, uh, and you see this in the GERM. You can look it up. It, it was changed in the early 70s, right? This isn't something that had to happen thanks to the pushback of, I don't know, the Society of St. Bicenet or some other group, right? <laughs> this, this was changed right away. Now, let's look, if you don't mind, Ezekiel, I'd like to go through those four accusations because they yes, apply yes. them to the missile. So the first accusation is the real presence, right? And so here what I'm doing is what Delafon basically said it's not worth doing. And I agree, it's not really worth doing because it's a silly study, but let's do it anyway because of its influence. So real presence. Uh, at this uh, section, uh, the, the GERM here, the, the brief critical study says that the GERM here cites Matthew 18, 20, which is basically the quote where Jesus says that where several of you, are, uh, where, where two or three of you are gathered together, there I am with you, right? Uh, his presence is there. And so the brief critical study says this promise, which refers only to the spiritual presence of Christ with his grace, is thus put on the same qualitative plane, save for the greater intensity, as the substantial and physical reality of the sacramental Eucharistic presence. First of all, the church has never used the language of a physical presence. It's used the language of real true and substantial so that's that's not accurate so <laughs> we want to we could critique the brief critical study here but the point being here is don lafon's response which is very simple he says in chapter one of the institutio generalis paragraph two in other words the previous page we can read the following quote it is therefore of the greatest importance that the celebration of the mass that is the lord's supper be so arranged that the sacred ministers and the faithful taking part in it according to the proper state of each, according to the proper state of each, by the way, may derive from it more abundantly those fruits for the sake of which Christ the Lord instituted, excuse me, the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood and entrusted it to the church, his beloved bride, as the memorial of his passion and resurrection. So in other words, this is the context for the Latin word eminenter, which is especially, you know, uh, in the in the Eucharist. So his presence is of a different kind is what it's saying. Now, the brief critical study adds the following thing. It says, in number eight, a subdivision of the mass, uh, sorry, in number eight of the germ, a subdivision of the mass into liturgy of the word and Eucharistic liturgy immediately follows with the affirmation that in the mass is made ready, quote, the table of God's word as of, quote, the body of Christ, so that the faithful, quote, may be built up and refreshed, end quote, and an altogether improper assimilation of the two parts of the liturgy as though between two points of equal symbolic value. What does that mean? I think this is crucial. Uh, this is a really important section here. The brief critical study is saying, speaking of the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, you know, uh, as two um, places in which God word, God's word is present is in fact a problem, right? Do, do these guys know anything about the, the, the fathers of the church? Like, I don't understand how you can 
just gloss over the entirety of the patristic tradition here, right? Pope Benedict XVI says in Sacramentum Caritatis, paragraph 45, quote, if it is to be properly understood, the word of God must be listened to and accepted in a spirit of communion with the church and with a clear awareness of its unity with the sacrament of the Eucharist. Indeed, the word which we proclaim and accept is the word made flesh. It is inseparably linked to Christ's person and the sacramental mode of his continued presence in our midst. In other words, Pope Benedict XVI is reaffirming what the missal of Pope Paul VI is saying against you know what, what the brief critical Don't, studies. Another say. thing, the Catechism of St. Pius X, yes. he, he has a question which we ask, what is the reverence we, we, we must have towards the word of God? Yes. The is the same, the same reverence you have to have uh, uh, to the, mm -hmm. to the <laughs> body and blood of Christ. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I can't believe that that was in there. It, it's it, it, th yeah, so absolutely. You're you're completely correct, right? And, and this is profoundly patristic, right? And there's a rich theology there. Again, Sacramentum Caritatis is the place to go, right? From from uh, the Holy Father uh, Pope Benedict. Um, now, what, <laughs> the worst part is coming up right here, right? But before I get to that, uh, there's a there's a section where they complain about the use of the the Pauline formula in, in Saint Paul. Instead of the use of the synoptic one uh, in the anaphora in the canon, right, which is the the Pauline formula is a hoc facite in meam commemorationem, right, which is a, do this in remembrance of me. They're complaining that we're using the passage of Paul instead of the passage from the synoptic gospels. Th th that's the complaint, and they're saying this, in fact, changes the Eucharistic sacrifice to a mere commemoration. Bro, they're using the language of scripture from St. Paul. Sorry, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Okay, uh, let, let, this is the worst part, man. This is the worst part. Let me quote directly from the brief critical study. Quote, <laughs> sorry, this, this is the worst part. Quote, furthermore, the acclamation assigned to the people immediately after the consecration, we announce thy death, O Lord, until thou comest, introduces yet again, under cover of eschatology, the same ambiguity concerning the real presence. Without interval or distinction, the expectation of Christ's second coming at the end of time is proclaimed just as the moment when he is substantially present on the altar, almost as though the former and not the latter were the true coming. Th this is the worst part of the entire study yeah. because this shows a radical ignorance of a, a, a Catholic theology of the Eucharist of eschatology and of ecclesiology. It's so bad. I mean, yes. let, let, let me first read what Dola Fool says real quick. It's like a, a one-liner. He says, um, it's, it's up here. Sorry, just a second. Okay, Dola Fool says, however, the short critical study precisely attacks these formulas uh, that Cardinal Taviani actually adopted, right? Resorting to childish reasoning such as if the return of Christ is expected and desired, it is therefore because Christ is not really present under the Eucharistic species. <laughs> this is the level uh, uh, that, that we're dealing with here. And, and here's the point. How do you think the Eucharist was understood by the early church? And, and you know, this is something that grounds all of Eucharistic theology throughout the entire tradition. It was understood as the parousia, right? And so what do you find? So the book of Revelation is a book about many things, but it's really, you can tell when you read it about the liturgy. How does it end? It ends with the exclamation Maranatha, right? Which is the Hebrew word that can be read in two different ways. It's a, it's like a pun. It can be read, our Lord is here, or it can be read, our Lord come, right? And, and this is also in the Didache. And Cardinal Ratzinger, as well as other uh, liturgical theologians such as Louis Bouillet and, and many others, even preconciliar and throughout the entirety of the tradition, talk about how in the Eucharist you have both an actual presence and an expectation of the parousia. And it's both a fulfillment and an anticipation. This is what a lot of theologians, theologians call realized eschatology or uh, um, inaugurated eschatology, right? This is, this is basic Christianity 101. Right. I mean, Dr. Hahn talks about this ad nauseum in his books, The Lamb's Supper and and, uh, you know, other of his uh, works on biblical uh, theology. I mean, 
everyone knows this. <laughs> so, okay, maybe back then, I guess they didn't, and that would be a problem that the church remedied. That, to me, is the worst part of the entire study. It really shows how, um, as to, to use Don Leffel's words, how childish this really is. Yes. But let, let, yeah. let me say something here. Go now. ahead. Go ahead. Um, another another claim I, I hear uh, frequently here in Argentina uh, is that, well, the, this similar to what you have read in the Krigo mm. study, you know, the, the new mass uh, hinders the dogma of the real presence. Yeah. That is when I, I don't know how they can say that when the, the formula of the consecration before the consecration, the priest says uh, something like, please, Lord, uh, receive this offering so that you can convert them in the body and blood of Christ. You know, they are affirming with, clarity. you know, it's all there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, why don't we talk about that next? Right. Why don't we talk about sacrifice? Right. Because it. Um, <laughs> Okay, you're you're absolutely correct. Here's one one last point about real presence, and then I think sacrifice will address uh, address this uh, more in depth. But right. the short the the brief critical study says, "quote In the insistent recommendation to distribute in communion the species consecrated during the same mass, we find reasserted a disparaging attitude toward the tabernacle, as toward every form of Eucharistic piety outside of the mass." So in other words, they're saying, because the church recommends that when people receive communion at mass, it ought to be the communion that was consecrated during that mass. And they're saying that's an attack on the real presence in the tabernacle. Are you serious? And here's the thing. The reason why the church is saying this is precisely because of St. Thomas's teaching that the communion of the faithful Right. That the unity that is formed, this is St. Augustine, that the sacrament of charity is what the Eucharist is. This is the res tantum of the Eucharist. Right. In sacramental theology, you have the the sacramentum tantum, sacramentum tantum, the res at sacramentum and the res tantum. The res tantum is the effect. Right. It's the unity of the people. And so the Eucharist, when it's celebrated, right, affects the communion of the people present at the mass. That's why the church is saying that that's how it should be, right? I mean, this is 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 17. You know, although we are many, you know, because there is one loaf of bread, you know, we who are many become one body, right? Because it's 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 Eucharistic ecclesiology, which is at the heart of so much of uh, the theology of the Second Vatican Council, of, uh, of especially, you know, Joseph Ratzinger, which is the person I'm studying right now. So the point being is this is completely silly. But uh, I think sacrifice is the, the next place to go. Yes. Anything you want to add? I want to add something, you know, yeah. with the with the um, uh, uh, refutations you have made, or, or just by quoting the, the the critical study, you have already shown it, it is not serious. Yeah. Do you want me to stop? <laughs> we, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be we shouldn't yeah. continue with this. But we will do the the part of the sacrifice. Then then we will pass to to some questions because. Okay. Uh, although, although we 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 recognize that the Novus Ordo is orthodox, you know, it can be, it has some parts. Maybe you have to interpret in light of tradition, as uh, Ottaviani said. You know, um, mm -hmm. we we can't deny there is a liturgical crisis nowadays. So oh, absolutely talk, not. Yeah, we have to talk. There's... We have to talk about that. So. Uh, yes, you better uh, finish with the part of the sacrifice because the claim here is that. Uh, the Novus Ordo is a sacrifice of um, praise, words, praise, and, and, yeah. and thanksgiving, but not a propitiatory. You know? Right. Uh, yeah. Mm. And just just one other thing, when you uh, talked about the, the definitions which were made of the of the mass, uh, which were pretty vague at the beginning, then they were yeah. corrected. Another thing we, we have to say here is that if you read the post conciliar magisterium, you know, uh, John Paul II, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, their encyclicals on the on the Eucharist, on the Mass, uh, or the Catechism, the definition, the traditional definition of the Mass is everywhere. So it's everywhere. <laughs> the, the, only, the, only, the only thing you have to do if you have doubts with the no sort of is go to the parallel text, text, you know, 
Go to yeah. the ones who have implemented the novel sort of and see what they said. You know, if if you yeah. have doubts, oh, what does me memorial uh, uh, mean? You know, I can I, I want to read something from the compendium of the Catechism of Benedict the Sixteenth. You know, go ahead, yeah. Uh, number two, two hundred and eighty. In what way is the Eucharist a memorial of the sacrifice of Christ? This is the the question. You know, mm -hmm. and one would guess. After after reading, uh, you know, uh, the SSPX or independent traditionalists, oh, here, uh, prepare yourself because here comes the heresy, you know, here yeah. comes Protestantism. Well, let's let's read what what what's the answer to the question? In what way is the Eucharist a memorial of the sacrifice of Christ? The answer is quote: The Eucharist is a memorial in the sense that it makes present and actual. The sacrifice which Christ offered to the Father on the cross, once and for all on behalf of mankind. The sacrificial character of the Holy Eucharist is manifested in the very words of institution. This is my body which is given for you, and this cup is the new covenant in my blood that will be shed for you. Mm -hmm. the, sac the sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one and the same sacrifice. The yeah. priest and the victim are the same. Only the manner of offering is different in a bloody manner on the cross, in an unbloody manner in the Eucharist. End quote. You That's know? Trent 101. Yeah. This is Trent. You know, this is yeah. Trent. So, <laughs> yeah. No, maybe I, I, I won't I won't I won't say that uh, the, the, the definitions which were first made uh, in the in the Institutio Institutio Generalis uh, were hundred percent orthodox. Maybe they were not, you know. I yeah. won't say uh, they were ambiguous. There, yeah, uh, there was only there one. Was, it was ambiguous. Yeah, it was. It was ambiguous. So, but, mm -hmm. but we can we can interpret it in light of tradition. You know, we have yeah. these parallel texts. With, but it's not even there anymore. The the church changed it right away as soon as this was brought up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 just it's a moot point. It's not it's not a thing anymore, and it hasn't been. It, the the year the missile was published, right? And so, um, or it might have been a couple. I'm not exactly sure. Might, but if anything very quickly it was changed but the point being is that we're talking about the rubrics of the missile in, in themselves and the thing about the rubrics of the missile yes they're more biblical and yes they're more patristic but then what these guys are saying is that because they're not scholastic in the sense of they're not uh the terms of uh certain passages of the council of trent and they're, they're going you know back to the sources in a certain sense you might say well therefore it means protestantism is true <laughs> like no that's not how that works and in fact the missal itself used sacrificium, right, in the orate fratres, you know, twice. It used in ev all four anaphoras of the new missal yeah. has oferimus tibi, you know, it has uh, uh, corpus et sanguinis, right, it was sanguinem Christi, right? oferimus, oferimus, oferimus tibi, right, offering, sacrifice, and sacrificium, you know, acmanibus uh, tuis, uh, right, it's all there in, in sacrificial language. But it is, in fact, using more uh, uh, gr grounded in Scripture and the fathers. But it's trying to help us go back to Scripture and understand Scripture in light of tradition and, 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 and be more grounded in sacred Scripture, which is why the Liturgy of the Word, right, has become three different readings that are much more uh, diverse and, and, and interconnected. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's really silly. I, now, you're right, though, to point out, but are you saying everything's fine, Dom? Like... No, there's a massive liturgical crisis, and it's horrendous. And we can talk about it. It's getting a lot better in a lot of places. But uh, the more I've been reading about uh, uh, the theology of Pope Benedict on the liturgy, you know, I'm realizing how there's a serious problem here that we need to address. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, I, I got into an argument about Ad Orienta with someone, and uh, so I, I I read Pope Francis's. Uh, 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 is it a, I can't remember if it's an apostolic exhortation. That's it's video, it's you know, that's yes, video. yeah. It's, it's actually, it, it's beautiful. It's really, it's really, really helpful because it, uh, it, I, I'm, I'm writing an article that I'm going to, I'm going to use that to argue for ad orientem, right. Uh, with Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation. And I think, uh, uh, that the theology laid out, which is drawn from, uh, Guardini and others, um, but goes beyond, you know, and, and, you know, isn't identical with it is in fact uh the it's the theology of sacrosanctum concilium and it's definitely not the chaos that we see uh, but again this chaos has really abated i mean in my parish we sing gregorian chant we uh you know father faces east 
Um, you know, he follows the rubric, so oh my, you know, and uh, there, you know, no one thinks that it's not a sacrifice. Uh, there might be some nominal Catholics that are present, sure, but that's everywhere. Uh, and in the TLM, I hate that term, but in the TLM parishes, you know, there won't be nominal Catholics because it, they're they're seeking out these masses. And, the, and that brings up another point, which is, why are there all these abuses in the Novus Ordo, but not in the traditional masses, right? Yes. Dom, sorry, can I yeah. can I say something else about the, 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 the argument of the uh, new mass? Yeah don't having the propitiatory element and then we go to the yeah we finally go to to, to this to, to these questions yes maybe uh, you are more familiar than me with the the, the anaphoras of the no sort of which uh dom lafon quotes there but i, I i'll he quotes them in in latin i, I will yeah. say it in latin and then i will say it in english you know translated go ahead please we have anaphora two of saint hippolytus Memores igitur mortis et resurrectionis eius tibi domine panem vite et calicem salut, salut, salutis offerimus gratias agentes. Trans mm -hmm. Translation is something like that, like, like this. Therefore, remembering his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks. Just here, the, the term cup of salvation, this is uh, propitiatory, you know? Yes, well, absolutely, yeah. Then yeah. we have, yeah. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Ah, anaphora three is is more more precise even it says memores offerimus tibi gratias referentes hoc sacrificium vivum et sanctum respice quesumus in oblationem ecclesiae tue et agnoscens ostiam quis voluisti molationem placari concede qui corpore et sanguine fili tui reficimus e costia noster reconciliationis proficiat the translation is something like this we offer you giving thanks this living and holy sacrifice. Look, we visit you at the offering of your church and recognizing the sacrifice by whose immolation you wish to be a beast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I can understand how, how they, yeah. they keep on saying this is not propitiatory, you know? Yeah. No, it, it's ridiculous. He's, he's, he, he's, it is talking about the Lord being a beast by the sacrifice of the of the holy mass which is the renovation of the calvary Excellent it's in, point. incredible yeah. incredible and it goes on mm -hmm. grant that we may restore ourselves with the body and blood of your son here dogma of the real presence may yeah. this sacrifice be successful in our reconciliation this is propitiatory <laughs> and, and finally yeah. anaphora four offerimus tv eius corpus and sanguinem sacrificium tv acceptabile et toti mundo salutare Respice Domine in Ostium. We offer you his body and blood, a sacrifice acceptable to you and salutary to the whole world. So yeah. I, no, I yeah. think that you can yeah. just refute the claims of the noble sword of being not propitiatory by just quoting the noble sword, of, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if yeah. then the priest in the mass doesn't say this in, in, in loud voice, you know, that's not my problem, you know. Mm -hmm. You go to the mission and you check it out yourself. Yeah. If no, your it's, priest it's, doesn't it's, want to say it, that's another thing, you know. How the yeah. how the mission is put in practice is another thing that how, oh, how the mission is per se. Yeah. So now now I think we can uh, go to what were you were talking, you know. We no, can yeah. we, we, we can interpret the, the noble sordo or or even not interpret, just just recognize it that uh, as orthodox, which it, it is orthodox. And if you have any doubts, you can interpret it in light of the parallel text, in light of all the creation. There, there is no problem. But mm -hmm. how do we answer to the question, for example, the following question? Um, you know, uh, why af just after the liturgical reform, um, no one knows anymore what the Mass is? Everyone thinks, first, Catholics don't go to Mass. First, Catholics don't go to the ones who yeah. go to mass does do do not do not know this is the renovation and actualization of the sacrifice of the Calvary, you know. So, and this yeah. is propitiatory. They, 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 people don't know that. People think the they will communicate. They have faith in the real presence, but they don't know this is the again the, oh, yeah, the sacrifice of the cross. Yeah. You know, don't you think don't, that is because of the ambiguity of the novel sort of text itself, as as many, many people claim. 
how how can we answer to this? Why there is so much corruption in the in the practice of the no order? Yeah. This doesn't happen with the with the Trident team mass, you know. Trident mass is, is is done according to rubrics. If you go to a no order to five no order in the same town, they will be yeah. probably the five different uh, ways of <laughs> separating. So yeah, that is depending where. That, that is, depending where, obviously, depending where, yeah. but that yeah. is quite a fact. I think we, we we cannot deny that. So how could we could, could we answer? This is there. There, yeah. there are two ways of, of of explaining this. I think one is say you know the novel sordo is bad, uh, and it, it's yeah. it's it's intrinsic uh, uh, ambiguity or uh, you know Protestantism makes uh, priests celebrated wrong. Or you can say uh, what I think is personally is. People are just don't know the the, the true doctrine, and that's, well, that's why definitely they, true. People, that's why they uh, already bad, and uh, you know bishops may not be doing their job. You know they are not uh, yeah. punishing the, the priests for celebrating bad. That was sort of. No, I mean it's a good point. I mean one thing I want to point out is that uh, uh, the authors of this short critical study here don't seem to be aware of the hundreds of Eastern anaphoras, hundreds of Eastern anaphoras, of e Eastern liturgies, you know, and, and the language in, in all of them is different. I mean, anyway, and so and as you read, you know, the, the propitiatory and the, the sacrificial language is quite simply there. It's there. And, you know, this idea that, oh, there's this ambiguity in the, the new missile, you know, I'm not so sure that, 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 you know, this could be, I'm not so sure the argument is that, okay, I'll concede there's some ambiguity, but you can read that in light of tradition. You know, I, maybe in other cases, other than the mass, we can talk about that. But in the mass itself, it seems to me that if your claim is that, so what's the claim? What What is ambiguous here, right? Well, let, let me just quote last thing I promise, last thing I quote here, it says, <laughs> yes. it says, quote, there is no need to comment on the utter indeterminateness of the formula panis vitae, bread of life, and putus spiritualis, right, which is, you know, spiritual drink, which might mean anything, they say right here. Christ is present only spiritually among his own here. Bread and wine are only spiritually, not substantially changed. So the first thing is like, these are from sacred scripture and putus spiritualis. That's in the old missile as well. Like, give bread, me a bread of life. Uh, it's Sounds familiar from uh, <laughs> from the from Gospel John of John, Six. right? Yeah, Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> like, what do you mean utter indeterminateness? What are you talking about? Like, and 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 that here it says that Christ is only present spiritually, not substantially. What do you think? Are they saying that what's really real is material, and what's less real is spiritual? That's that's materialism. This is just bad theology, right? Uh, 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 the substance of something is distinct from its accidents because the accidents is what's available to the senses. It's what's material, right? But what's what's substantial is, is what grounds the reality of the thing. And that is available to the intellect because it's not categorized as material. It's more real than what's material. So this is just bad philosophy, bad, bad theology, a complete, it seems like a complete ignorance of the patristic era or of the language of scripture or of the old missile. It, they can't be ignorant of that. So like, I just don't understand what's going on here. But let, let's answer your question um, about the the today, right? I think that those who seek out the 1962 missile, right? First of all, uh, as everyone knows and everyone agrees, statistically, these are few people, right? Um, and uh, and they, they seek it out intentionally. So we're talking about people that are not nominally Catholic, right? That are not just going through, uh, well, they're not nominally Catholic. If they're at a traditional 1962 missal in Latin, they sought it out. They found it and they traveled to go there. Right. And there's few of these people. So if that's the case, first of all, the like like the 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 demographic. Right. Is is very specific here. So obviously there's going to be differences between the celebration of the 62 and the celebration of the mass and most of the Roman rites. Right. And so in a certain sense, the 1962 became the opposite, culturally speaking, of what people ran away from. Right. So it's treated as the mass where the rubrics are followed versus what they ran away from, which is the mass where the rubrics are not always followed. And there's all these different things going on. And we don't like that. So like this is just a sociological and demographic observation that that's why it's the case. But the fact of the matter is. 
before this dichotomy, this cultural dichotomy between the new missile and the old missile, right, then things were not the way they are now, right? And so, you know, this there, there was different kinds of abuses. I've seen all out, run of the mill, regular abuses of the rubrics in the in the 1962. And uh, you know, as a, as an altar server, I'm like, what is the priest doing? You, uh, you, yeah. you were from the SSPX, right? Yeah, I grew up uh, SSPX of Fraternity St. Peter, and I've you know, been the masses from Institute Christ the King. The, by the way, Institute Christ the King, beautiful liturgy. Uh, the way they do things is wonderful. I'm not trying to bash anyone here. I'm just saying we all know that because of human nature, abuses are in places. But but this is in in intentional groups, right? Before the council, it was everywhere that the, the 1962 was set. So are you saying that everything was just beautiful and wonderful and then the new missile wrecked everything. It, it doesn't make sense because both missiles have rubrics. So the question isn't whether one has rubrics and the other doesn't. The question is this demographic and cultural shift where you have the, the rubric mass where you don't follow the rubrics and the rubric mass where you do follow the rubrics, right? And that one is few because people seek it out. Another yeah. thing is that a, a rebel priest, a rebel priest who, who, who doesn't want to follow the rubrics, won't follow it in the trade into mass either yeah well the thing is sometimes the, those priests are dawson priests and they actually want to learn it so they will but here's the thing and this is the genius of pope benedict when they do learn the 1962 it it improves their celebration of the the missile of pope paul the six and that's really the pope benedict's point he wanted to kind of make this cultural divide into a fruitful understanding that rubrics do need to be followed right so it's just nonsense it's 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 very shallow kind of you know tribal uh, superficial, um, combative thinking, right? It's not, it's not serious stuff, but does that, does that make sense about the, the, why the missiles are treated differently, at least in general? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, but I do, can I, I know we're already an hour and, and six minutes, but, uh, there is a genuine liturgical crisis and there's, there's real reasons for it. And, and, uh, um, uh, you know, there's this wonderful, well, of course, this is the book that I recommend to everybody, right? This is The Spirit of the Liturgy by um, uh, Joseph Ratzinger. It, came out, it was published in 2000. And in it, you have this beautiful theology of the liturgy. And another book that's really good, but it's a little more dense. It's kind of like a doctoral dissertation, but it's a, a Roland Millar's book. It's called A Living Sacrifice, Liturgy and Eschatology in Joseph Ratzinger. And he kind of synthesizes a lot of the Pope, uh, you know, Ratzinger or Pope Benedict's uh, theology of liturgy. And if you want something serious and beautiful, this is where you got to go, guys. And uh, we weren't able to go into all of the, the nonsense of the brief critical study. But this is why no one's talked about it, because no one's taking it seriously. Now, uh, if we look at the contents, you know, it becomes clear. But there's some serious and beautiful and uh, awesome liturgical theology out there. Focus on that. But the crisis is real, and I think it has a lot to do with the movements in modernity, right? So to summarize maybe an aspect of it, um, because uh, with Immanuel Kant, right, there was a revolution in our way of thinking, right? In the in the patristic era and the medieval era, right, the, the human person, right, revolved around reality. Reality was given, and we came to know reality, right? But with Kant, there's a shift that happens where the human person's at the center and reality revolves around the human person, right? It's almost like a Copernican revolution. And what that means is that for the for the medieval and for, for the patristic era, right, what's really real isn't what man makes, right, but what God creates and God himself and, 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 and what man makes passes away. It's like a world of shadows. The really real is God, right? And reality, uh, as it comes from God, he's the one that makes things real, not us. But with this Copernican revolution, suddenly the metaphysical questions, right, uh, are not real anymore. This is Kant, right? But what's real is our mind projecting structure into the chaos around us, right? What's really real is what man makes. Now, this gets taken up by Hegel and his understanding of history and ultimately by Marx, right, who uh, applies it to political philosophy, and so for Marx, it really is, um, you know, you kind of have this shift from homo adorans, right, the adoring man, the, the liturgical man, to homo faber, 
right? Or homo faber, which is the making man. This is progress, technology, right? Uh, this this kind of evolutionary idea of social uh, uh, change and reform. And this is what infected and infects the liturgy, which is this idea that we can make the liturgy in our image. We are the creators of the liturgy. But the reality is God gives us through the church the liturgy, and we are shaped and made into Christ by the liturgy. It's the other way around. That's at the heart of the liturgical crisis is our understanding of what liturgy actually is, not these stupid polemics about he said he said she said that uh good old michael davis got into right but the point <laughs> being the, the 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 point being is really it's it's about an understanding of the liturgy and a, a more beautiful more profound and more serious theology not this nonsense um anyway and uh um yeah so that, that, that's what i got what do you think oh i i agree i agree <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> I, one last question I wanted to ask you uh, is the following, and then we close up because it will be very long. Yeah. Um, it, it's there, it is a twofold question. First of all, first of all, um, you grew up in the SSPX, and then you the FSSP ICK. You are familiar with the with the tradition mass. Yeah. Uh, so now you attend the no sort of right right uh mostly yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh, you you think you like giving a testimony of your personal life of faith you think that the no sort of is is harming your soul no <laughs> not at all <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> i mean if anything's harming my soul it's it's uh uh, it's, it's things like the brief critical study, but also like just a <laughs> poor, poor, poor liturgy. So that, you know, uh, bad liturgy, like badly said, uh, doesn't harm me. Cause I, I feel like I realized that it's just, you know, it's, it's sinful, uh, misunderstanding of reality, whatever. Uh, I, you know, it doesn't bother me anymore. You know, so uh, I actually started, you know, I, I have a, uh, I teach Gregorian chant on my parish and now we have a scola. And we sing at the mass, and again, Father faces east, as we said, and he follows the rubrics. Um, and so it's it's uh, no, my faith is uh, is fine. I think you know, I mean, <laughs> it's God who awesome. gives awesome. me the gift of faith. But okay, yeah. okay. That, it must be an exception. It must be an exception. Oh, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The many <laughs> stories I right. hear. Yeah, no, people across the U.S. are telling me this young generation of priests. These young people, man, the Pope Benedict's uh, uh, influence is still bearing fruit. And, and yeah, the, I'm very hopeful. Things are looking actually really awesome. good. Um, you know, the, the, the last question is, yeah, you you think it would be good to have a like a reform of the reform? <laughs> Yeah, I do. Uh, but but what does that mean is the big question. But yes, yeah. uh, it, Pope Benedict said in his book, Feast of Faith, very little of all of this has to do with the difference in missiles. And, and, and if you read all of his liturgical theology, you start to get a picture of what he means. It, it starts with a proper understanding of the nature of liturgy. That's where it starts. Then you can quibble about rubrics, right? And I think that you know, missiles can be criticized, but not just the one of Pope Paul VI. Like many missiles can be criticized, right? And so we can talk about that in the future. But first, let's talk about what liturgy is. And that's where the reform of the reform begins. It has to do with our celebrandi, really, I think, and the proper spirit of the liturgy, to quote from his book. All right. So let's end up with a prayer, right? Sure, yeah. In nome Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicuterat in principio et nunc semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. Maria Santissima, ora pro nobis. In nome Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So, Amen. Dom, Amen. thank you very much. Thanks for putting up with me, Ezekiel. My scattered brain and my notes. Yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> it was fun. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Good job. Good job reading Benning the 16th. You know, I, I think we have to read it. Read, read him. Uh, yes, we have to read. I it. <laughs> I comment I commented to you that uh, there is a, a a Spanish version of like two two 
tomes of 600 pages each of yeah. the uh, teachings on Vatican II teachings. His commentary, yeah. Collegiality, religious liberty, ecumenism. So, I think sections of it are translated, but not all of it. So that would be great if those could be translated. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do it in the future. Ah, yes, do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure being on, on the show. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. See you. See you. Thanks. Good. Good.